Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Right to Read Initiative. My name is Dr. Katherine Garforth from Garforth Education, and the Right to Read Initiative is all about promoting best practices in reading instruction. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Matthew Kirstead of Alberta, and we're going to be talking about how he has helped his school move from a, a balanced literacy approach to a structured literacy approach over the past several years. And he's going to give us some insight onto what he recommends for schools looking to make that transition. Good day. How are you this evening? Oh, I'm doing fantastic. It's a pleasure to be back with you here. Thank you. Why don't you give listeners just a quick recap about who you are, your position, and how you've come to be doing what you're doing. Well, absolutely. Uh, as I've been uh, serving as a principal in schools for going on 30 years, just about 30 years now in, at all grade levels. I'm uh, currently principal of a K-6 school in Alberta, uh, where we have had a, sort of a laser focus. We've had one goal every year, and that's been on literacy. And uh, we are now at the point where it's no longer going to be a goal in our school that we've we've met the areas as, as much as we needed, well, as much as collectively we needed to, and we're just focusing on individual pockets and stuff like that. But other things are we'll be moving on to other goals now. So that's that's a real celebration for our school. Wonderful. And anything that we can do to get to that point where it's just incorporated into what we do at a school is amazing because uh, that transition takes typically between three to five years. It can be a bit of a bumpy road, but it's an important road to take. So I know yesterday when we spoke, you discussed the importance of using data to dictate practice. Um, and you, you felt that way early on in your career before you uh, looked into this further. So can we just start there talking about um, how you currently use data to inform your decisions at school and how you were able to get that in at the beginning? Sure. So uh, fairly easily at this school, because I came into this school just as they're adding the early years, the Div 1, the K123 to the school. Uh, previous to that, it was a 4 to 8 school. Um, and so at bringing those things together. So it's kind of wide open. There wasn't a, an existing culture. There wasn't an exi existing practices uh, because the teachers who came to fill this due to a grade reconfiguration in the community came from all kinds of different schools. So all kinds of different things came up. But as you Im imagine, because of the acculturation of things like balanced literacy, those things came with them as well. So I chose uh, with work from my previous schools and getting more data literate um, and using uh, data informed uh, process in the school is um, we didn't start right off with trying to change teacher practice. Our, the first conversation is what do our students look like and what does our instruction look like over time and how are, how are we impacting you know, that, lo that lower 30, 25% of our kids with our instruction? Do we see significant gains over time? And uh, so the data that we were gathering initially was more of like the fuel in the change car. It's uh, what sort of drove our conversations amongst ourselves or in my meetings with teachers following um, our assessment times and where we started talking about practice and student performance. And then also around resource allocation, using it to drive what kinds of resources do we need where and with whom? So when we're looking at, so that could be having additional um, tier three pull out learning uh, t uh, literacy intervention. It could be around re-resourcing ourselves away from leveled books into uh, more um, decodables and things like all, all those kinds of things. So we use data as sort of just the fuel to make us, that let us focus on everything that had to do with literacy. And once we got through that, the that helped us in identifying, you know, then we started looking at the data itself. What is it that our kids are missing? What is it, where are sort of those instructional uh, uh, deficits that are happening? What do we need to improve on? And the very first thing we did, and, and then like a number of schools around the Fongeville 
phonological awareness in the beginning, phonemic awareness and those things. And the, we, the data does a great job in helping us there. And we, and we started right with as soon as our kids come in kindergarten. No, we, did, we didn't wait long. We wanted to ensure that uh, the programming, what we were doing was uh, on spot at, right to begin with. And then once we identified those, it was, it was around helping teachers develop those, that pedagogical and content knowledge that they need to do in the school uh, with uh, working with the kids and also support, uh, supporting them with the um, intervention groups and having staff and resources available to support them through that as well. Wonderful. Now, you started out with this and, and doing more of a, a group approach to professional development. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely. And yeah, and yeah, we transitioned into, you, you know, um, I mean, it's well recognized in education that the least effective professional development is the sort of the sit and get kind of stuff in groups. Um, you go to a conference, you come back, and if you don't use it within the first week, 80% of it's gone and it keeps going. And, and we spend so much money and wasting resources on something like that. And, exp- and if you look at a staff, everybody's not on the same page. So perhaps it's time to rethink that we that everybody doesn't need the same professional involvement. When we did start, we brought everybody together to draw a baseline. This is sort of bare minimum. This is where everybody needs to be looking and doing. And some, so some we've, we, we know are above that, but most didn't meet that baseline. And that's not unusual in education. If you look at, you know, teachers, especially in Div 1, their primary job is to teach reading. They're reading teachers, but how many of them have the content knowledge around early literacy and that to be not effective in teaching our sort of our top two thirds who are going to learn to read despite us or mm-hmm. without us, but how talented and how knowledgeable are we in assisting the bottom third in our classrooms? And so that's where the development um, really needed to to work with her. So we're talking about effective tier one instruction in our classrooms and also the tier two. So when we're doing our centers approach and understanding how we can support uh, kids in the classroom, because we really need to have effective tier one and tier two instruction. Uh, because if, if you don't, and you say you've got, I don't know, 80% of your kids not meeting the benchmark or whatever it is you've chosen, well, you can't do tier three intervention on 80% of your kids. That's called tier one. So mm-hmm. we, you have to back that back up again. And so that's what we did. And I, and I think not to, uh, not to toot my own horn, but um, one of the things that my research and my work, because I also work with other school jurisdictions with principals and things like that, that to have a transformational change in your school, to have something that is from one end to the other, not pockets of teachers doing well, you have to have the principal on board. Your schools will not succeed if the principal is not knowledgeable and be able to hold a conversation with teachers and do observations, do the instructional leadership in class if they've, they have a hands-off approach to literacy in schools. So um, in, in the many principals that I work with, we do a lot of work around developing that understanding around how to understand data and what literacy and being able to um, serve in that instructional leadership role. It's not that a principal has to be better, but they do need to be able to look in a classroom and see good instructional practices and be able to make constructive feedback to teachers around that. So uh, in, in an update to the Coleman report, um, and I'm very, forgetting the author's name, you could look at it, it's, it's called the update to the Coleman report, where instead of looking at student achievement, they looked at student growth. Um, the Coleman report said there was as much, was comparing there's as much difference from in schools. There was more difference in achievement in schools than there was between schools. But when they changed that, that conversation around and said, let's look at student growth, well, they did. They looked at 200 million assessments over about an eight year period in the US uh, in all 50 states. Um, and they found that no, in fact, it's between schools that the when we when we take student growth as the measure, and that we can have something like as much as an eighty percent difference between two schools, and that's after taking in F, uh, into account SES, ELL, and all of those things. And so, if you can imagine that most schools. Uh, will have a similar teaching staff. There might be, you know, just like hockey teams, some might have a McDavid and some, you know, and so on and so forth. But overall, then I'm, I'm, 
I have put it out there that the determining factor in that the school achievement comes down to the coach or it's the principal that's in the school and how they drive that. So vitally important um, that, that principals are so engaged in that process and, and knowledgeable about it. Definitely. And really when you're looking even across the grade levels, the students that a principal is going to be seeing in their office often have issues with reading development as an underlying cause for their behavior. And if we look at the knowledge that a principal can gain from reading development and use that to inform their work with their students, especially when it comes to trauma, it adds just that extra level. So if as a principal, you're able to tease out some of the details that, you know, a, a classroom teacher may not have the background in, especially if they're new coming into your school, it's that leadership role that you can take in taking your, your teachers and your students forward. Yeah, and I, I think, Pat, even more than that, it's about setting a tone and a culture in your school. Mm-hmm. It's set, around setting a tone that, you know, that, don't wait for me. It, 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 you don't necessarily have to wait for me to develop your professional practice that uh, we can identify things and you can take on that self-direct, self-directed professional development yourself. As a matter of fact, I would suggest uh, to our listeners that that's, that's part of being a professional is that yeah, your professional development is ultimately your responsibility. Um, and, and, and that it would be up to you to find resources and time and things to make that happen because it is, it is an important part. And the principal sets the tone for that. I mean, it was, uh, I was, I was over 50 before I started my doctorate. I mean, it's, it's never going to pay for itself. I can tell you that much. It's, <laughs> it costs too much and it's too late in my career, but it's just that constant development of, of, of wanting to know and do better for the kids. Well, it may not pay for itself financially. But to the students' lives you're changing, it'll pay huge returns. It's, it's the teachers that are changing it. I'm just helping them along their way. Yeah. Well, together as that, that team. So you've talked about creating that culture. What advice do you give to principals in that position where they're setting they're starting to want to change the tone within their school. Start reading. Uh, start be, if you're if you you don't feel comfortable to be to take on the instructional leadership within uh, around literacy. Go through the process of being comfortable, and maybe um, let your staff join you in that process as well. Sort of a, a co-learning kind of uh, atmosphere. I have worked with another principal. Uh, she's, she's doing a fantastic job. I, I kind of wish I was where she is. She's just a beginning principal. I wish I was there when she was, but she uh, came up against that wall in our conversations that, you know, she doesn't know what she, she felt she did. And so she just opened herself up to staff and said, we're going to learn this together. We're going to go through this together, but she is intimately involved in that process in their school. It's, she doesn't hand it off to her vice principal or her reading specialist, stuff like that. She's involved in it. Um, and it's, you know, just like anything, it, it takes time to do that. And uh, I, uh, I uh, pass off to her for doing that so, so early in her career. Um, I mean, there's also practical things that need to be done in the school to, to help overall. You need to be, uh, the resources that you have in your school, do you have the ability to have a learning support or somebody to, to do those uh, tier three interventions in your school? Do you have the tools that are necessary? So we're typically we're looking at a lot of level B assessments. Once we're done screening, doing level B assessments to find more specifically what it is the kids need. And then once you find out that, what are the tools that you have, the scientifically, the, the rigorously proven tools to assist, to help kids develop in those areas? What is your library of that that you have to pull from? So, you know, there's a lot of, you can't buy all of this stuff in one year. It's, it's about a process of going through and getting the, you know, the right people in the right places to make that happen. Um, somebody said, you know, I, I had a grade one position posted and I had so many, uh, lots of applications as you might imagine, but I, 
my, I myself never hire a first year teacher to put them into grade one. I'll, I take experienced teachers that from two or whatever to put them there because it's such a developmental play around literacy, important time. And I, some of my best teachers are in grade ones and two and, and kindergarten, absolutely, because um, even the, that kind of thing makes a huge impact on kids, especially our struggling kids. So yeah, so from the, so from the lead, just to get back to your point, the leadership position is you need to be knowledgeable. You need to be comfortable in taking on that instructional leadership role. How you get there, there's a there's many different paths to get that, and also around resourcing your school and 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 it, both inside the classroom and outside the classroom as well to assist kids, and and you have to understand and be able to take what data is what kind of data you're gathering and massage that in a way that you can have conversations with people and use that as, as I said, the fuel around change, around seeing performance and stuff like that. And you're not, you, you won't get to a point if, if you're just new to this, you won't get to a point where progress monitoring is happening automatically both in and outside the classroom and you can pick up the data and you can ignore all the colors and you can look at the scores and look at for student growth and things like that. And there's, and be running like T tests to see if it's statistically significant or if it was just by fluke and, and these kinds of things. Yeah. And all of this stuff that happens and, and leads into it. But starting the process and doing it with your colleagues is it's it's so rewarding especially when you can move a school and you know now you know literacy is not a, a in our ed plan goal it's just something that happens for our school right now summer is coming up and you mentioned you know the first recommendation that you have is get knowledgeable get reading are there any things that you see as seminal pieces or ones that oh sure you know, yeah, like Kilpatrick, he's he's got a bunch of stuff. Yeah, that's uh, that's working. Um, uh, going to Reading Rockets, really, you can go to Reading Rockets. I love the site. Uh, you put whatever terms you want to put in there, you can start, and it comes up with amazing resources. Uh, Doctor Shanahan, I love his blog. Uh, mm -hmm. He talks about so much stuff. It's uh, that's kind of a go to for it. And also subscribe to subscribe to professional journals. It's amazing how many teachers do not subscribe to a professional journal, like the reading teacher, for example, um, and, and having these or just leaving them, you know, in the staff room for people to flip through when they're when they're on breaks and lunch or conversation pieces, but also more importantly, in, is developing your own knowledge around the topic. I mean, these, if you don't want to read a lot of research, I mean, here's a great place where research is condensed down to four or five pages. And you can has all the information if you want to expand it, but it is there and and just yeah developing that whole culture of learning. I mean, my goodness, we're in education; we should not shy away from learning. Yes, we're lifelong learners as educators, right? You know, just stop the day you get your diploma or your uh, degree, or or you know, just getting to the top of the pay grid and oh, I'm done. But yeah, yeah exactly. So one thing that we've been talking about, but I'd like to dive into a little bit deeper is screening and progress monitoring. Mm -hmm. Now these are flashy terms that everybody's speaking about, but can we go into what that actually looks like in practice in a school? But how do you make sure that your teachers have the time to do the screening within your classrooms? Yeah, so yeah, and I've worked with lots of lots of schools around this this notion of screening, how to make it work. And there are broad strokes we can do, but overall, it comes down to the specifics of school. If you're a small school, it's different. If you're a big school, so on. So I'll, I'll tell you how it sort of it's it's panned out over the years at my school. So I have a school, uh, K to six, as I mentioned, and it's just it's about 520 kids. We're not a small school. We're not a super big school. We're a, um, and we're a dual track. So we, we have French immersion and English, and it's about a two third, one third mix. Now, I will say at the outset, we also screen in English our French immersion kids uh, around that. And, and predictably in grade one and, and so on, that they score lower than their English counterparts. But again, we're looking at growth and uh, development in French immersion. Anyway, but that's an aside, that's a whole different conversation. Our screening when we first started, the, the teachers, how can we do this? How can we fit this in? Because a lot of the screening, the effective screening, particularly at uh, in our kindergarten grade one, is phonologically based. It's not, it has nothing to do with written. So it's 
it's around using your voice and then responding to it. So it has to be done one-on-one. -on -one. There's no group administering. There's no small group. It's one-on-one. -on -one, so it's time, it's time intensive with that respect. But it's also very good for teachers to do it because it gives them a different way of listening and hearing. Once you start to develop the background, they should know this and you're questioning the kids and they're going, oh my goodness, they can't do any of this. Well, you're going to make a little note and, and so on through class and you start building a profile. So there's that benefit. But how did it start? It started with my admin team supporting our teachers. So we would go in and take their classes. Uh, first, we did training on how to do the assessments correctly. Uh, because if you just, you know, something like Acadians or Dibbles, if you just let teachers do it without any training, um, your data is almost useless that you pull out of it because it is norm data. So it all has to be done the same way every single time and so on and so forth. So we did uh, two days of training with all our, our teachers. So finding that opportunity to do that is expensive. But past that, you, you get a little more assurance that what you're getting is useful information. Um, and we also use part of that to talk about the early literacy reading development stages for kids. But um, so we originally started that way. And then I would say, you know, if you need a sub, just book a sub, Have, you know, put it under school, meaning in comes a sub that you can watch your class while you're doing this. And, and so we had a lot of uptake initially around that, around the, the external supports. Um, now that we're my gosh, just about seven years into the, into the assessment part of it. There are some teachers, few teachers say, you know, I still would like to have the sub come in so I can do this. Yeah, it's no problem. Um, and there are some say, hey, could you look after my class for a little bit? Absolutely. But for the, for the most part, it's now just become part of the way we do business. So in there, in while well, the kids are doing some reading or if they're doing somewhere else, they're just pulling back the kids aside and, and getting it done over like a week time period. And, and it's just part of the classroom. So uh, it sort of became, this is just what we do in the school. It, it, it's not a super extra thing or anything. It's just part of what it is that we do. Um, and the and as I mentioned in our last uh, podcast, the excitement on on the teachers after, you know, all the, all the student uh, results have been put in and then looking at, what that means around the class and individual students and coming and having conversations about that is, is fantastic and very professionally rewarding from a principal's perspective, for sure, because it shows the engagement level of the teachers and, and looking for how they like, and a lot of the time I'll, I'll I know I'm talking fast, but the, I will, I'll give you a story. One of my grade two teachers, um, this fabulous teacher, and uh, she's newer to the profession. Well, not that new, but newer. Um, and her results came out at, at uh, Christmas time, uh, or just after Christmas, January, February. And I was shocked. The, the kids did not make the growth that uh, I had experienced with her uh, previously. And as a matter of fact, there was uh, some kids who had, had gone down and, and I'm going, and so the conversation was, we're heading into, you know, uh, teachers convention and stuff like that. I said, we, you know, we need to talk about this. I'm seeing here that I know you're doing all this great work, but there's something wrong. And so after, you know, that, and she's shocked, she, she doesn't know and, and stuff like that. And so then I started pulling these resources together because it had identified areas where the kids weren't doing, doing well and stuff like that. And saying, you know, you got to read this, that, that. And, we, and we started hunting. And then she came, uh, once we got back to school and the shock of all this was over. And plus, I think she had COVID at the same time. So she wasn't, so this happened, then she had COVID and was gone. So this big period of time, uh, and then she came back and said, yeah, I put the scores in wrong. <laughs> you know, a little bit of lesson for me is I'm going, oh my goodness, what's happened? You know, what there's a, there's an outline effect of COVID and instruction going on here and I, and I'm not seeing it anywhere else. So this is unique. Let's investigate. I didn't think that, uh, she, nobody had ever put the scores in wrong, but she had put them in shows. She, the scores got corrected and they were fantastic. So it was just. Yeah. One thing I want to highlight the importance of what you've just spoken about is that the teachers are doing the assessment and it's not you as the men going in or getting resource teacher to do it because they can learn so much about their students spending that time one-on-one. -on -one. Now these screening assessments aren't long. They take, by the time that you get the students set up, it's maybe about five, seven minutes, uh, depending on your, your classroom management. And the information that you can get from these is invaluable. And it's gonna, gonna set the tone for the year. And those uh, checkpoints throughout the year are going to help you tailor your instruction. And like you said, in this example, you're like, oh, okay, well, we need this. Let's, 
let's dive in. Maybe next time, did you get the scores incorrectly? Let's try re-entering those scores. <laughs> um, but that's huge. And the other thing that I've noticed some teachers struggle with when they first start doing screening and assessment is turning off the teacher in them during the assessment. And that's where you highlighted the importance that these are norm referenced and standardized. So they need to be administered the same. Mm -hmm. And there's some teachers that say, but I, I want to teach them and show them how to do it correctly. Well, that's not the opportunity to do this. You want to see where they are truly at, at this given point of time so that you can work, focus on your teaching later and provide that intervention or small group instruction for them. Uh, absolutely. And, and that's an important point that um, teachers, you know, are well-intentioned in that. And oftentimes uh, when I'm, I'm working with, when I'm training people or they're first starting, they want to give them a little more extra time or say, oh, do you want to reread that or something like that? And, and really you're hurting the child because you're having a child who pr will potentially have a reading disability. You're having them outperform their ability and perhaps won't fall on the radar to get the assistance that they need. Uh, the time to make them perform is during instruction time, not during screening time. And, and the other thing I think is important to note is your screening. You're, this is not a diagnostic instrument. This is not, this is roughly finding out in your, in your school, in your classrooms, who needs for, uh, another look at them. Uh, who, who do we need to have another look at? Because there's a potential problem. Um, some of the kids surprise us. Uh, you know, I thought this kid was a way better reader and look at this performance. And sometimes, you know, we're picking up, yes, they have uh, the poor reading, but they develop other skills to fool us. But other times it's because the kids, in fact, didn't test well uh, for, for whatever reason. So a screening doesn't necessarily give you all the information it might give you broad strokes like oh you might need to have four different groups in your classrooms based on this uh, profile and stuff like that and so on but when we start looking at individual kids especially in the severe range or, or that um, are destined for tier three intervention uh, there's other things that have to happen beyond that the screening information is insufficient uh, for us at that time so yeah. So having screening done consistently and the right way is vitally important, but I also don't want to uh, people to ascribe too much information to it either. But there is that also that professional knowledge of doing it one on one that the screening tool doesn't cover, but that you get to pick up as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And there's those subtle things that you can pick up when working with a student, especially when it comes to the phonological awareness and seeing how they're approaching the task uh, can be very informative. Um, and personally, I, I love doing those assessments and even the, the next uh, more diagnostic assessment, looking at something like at the, the CTOP is one that you mentioned yesterday. I, I love yeah, I love the CTOP. I, I guess that would be another advice to principals. Principals either themselves or on staff, they, they need to have some people who have level B assessment uh, qualifications. Uh, uh, some of these things that uh, assessments that we do, absolutely anybody can do it, but it's around the it's around the understanding of the assessment and then the interpretation of the results uh, that are important. And that kind of training gives you the background to be able to do that. Uh, the CTOP I love for a lot of different reasons, but one of the reasons I also, I like it is because it has a RAN component as well in it. So our random modified naming component in there. And that's uh, uh, been linked with understanding fluency. So if, if children, children are going to be struggling in fluency. Now, the, there that uh, sort of executive function, that kind of part of it, it's not adjustable for kids. You're kind of set for it for life. And RAN, so RAN, what the RAN does for us is it tells us what our expectations around um, intervention would be. If somebody has a very low RAN score that we know is going to be a long-term because we're, we've got to develop some other competencies or um, uh, strategies for the child to use. But if they're struggling and their RAND score is very high, then we're, perhaps we need to look somewhere else in there as well. So the, yeah, the test of phonological where our processing is of course also absolutely huge, the, the rest of the test. So that's, that's for, one, for sure one 
that every elementary school should have in, in, in their library of, of the diagnostic level B kind of testing. Absolutely. Yeah. And there is the, the nice one about that one is there is the early years version that you can do with those kids that are, are very early in their schooling process. Um, you know, even if uh, in, not everyone here is in Alberta or BC and they may actually have a junior kindergarten yeah. section uh, at their school. Uh, and for the kids that start kindergarten still at four years old because they where their birthday falls in the year, you can still use these measures with them. Absolutely. Uh, and that could be very informative, helping to know where to go in the future. The TOPA too, or TOPA two plus is also another one that, especially for our younger kids, it's the test of phonological awareness. Uh, so uh, sort of in there with the CTOP, uh, because the CTOPS more around processing, this is around awareness. That's a, a good one. I, I also like the batter reading and language uh, inventory uh, because it has a, a spoken language part to it. And so our um, SLPs uh, can, can, if you're not familiar with the, the uh, spoken part of it, receptive, expressive uh, delays and stuff. So the batter has a little bit of that. Now it's not at the same level as your SLPs might provide you, but it does, it points you in the right direction. And then, I mean, um, we use for, especially for our ESL or ELL kids and th that as well, we use the Woodcock Minos language survey. Again, a fantastic school uh, tool. So if we're just talking around the language, um, and also the subtests like in the Wyatt and the Woodcock Johnson and those kinds of things are, uh, uh, can, will drill down even deeper, uh, putting that out, even the Weschler fundamental academic skills, if we're wondering on a broader scale. Um, and here in Alberta, they're also uh, putting out for his, uh, the lens and the CC3. So I forget what the acronyms expand out to, but th so they're dealing with uh, letter names and sounds in the lens and the CC3 is around word reading. So these are tools that have been adapted. I think the lens is from Australia and the CC3 is from uh, somebody in Cambridge. Anyway, uh, and they're developing Alberta norms for it. And these are for our kindergarten, grade one, maybe grade two kids. So that's where that's very promising if, if they can do that correctly, um, or have that tool developed and develop really what would be kind of local norms for the province instead of relying off of uh, uh, the standard scores from US populations or, or so forth. One test that you mentioned yesterday, I believe that we haven't spoken about uh, yet is the tower test or, no, the, the Tosref Taurian uh, Tosrek. Yeah. 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 So uh, I, I would, uh, our school division standardize on those across the division. Now I, I, those are more of a research tool in my view. I mean, we can use them in schools and stuff. And I know, and I know that they are, um, advertise it to be used in school, but they don't tell you as much about uh, the particulars of a child as say an Acadian or, or something like that, or the devils or, or one of those tools do. Um, uh, the benefit is two of them are, you know, group administered, one of them's individually administered. But uh, again, I, just my own experience is they're good tools, they'll give you growth and, and things like that. I, I don't want to take away from them, but they, um, it seems that they're more set for system-wide look at, at student growth or looking at, because the standard scores in that, or sort of a research base from a practical application of influencing instruction in the classroom, I find them less useful, right. if that makes sense. Definitely. So we've talked about screening. Uh, and that's going to help you and the diagnosis is going to help you with the place, not the placement, but understanding the instruction that's needed in any intervention. The next step is making sure that intervention or small group instruction is working. And we do that with progress monitoring. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, I can talk about that again. Absolutely. So once we pull a child out, so they're sort of in our those are our lowest kids. Those are the kids who are in need of most, in, uh, most support and intervention. So if you think about their uh, achievement gap between their peers and them, it's only getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and to, have, um, to help them out, the learning 
slope is so steep to get them moved up. And we only have a finite amount of time. So by the time you, your screening's done, and if these kids are new to you, you're, you're past September, you're October, you got nine months left. And then you take out all the holidays and stuff like this. And anyway, what we need to make sure, there's two things we need to make sure with the kids, or three things. We need to make sure we know what we're going to intervene with them on. So your testing's done. You've done your screening. They've been identified. You've done some diagnostic work. You've and further. You're pretty sure where they need to be. Then you need to pick from your library of tools, of research, of of proven tools. You need to align what they need to do with one of the tools that you're using, and then you need to make sure that you've chosen right. And what I and that's where the progress monitoring comes in. We will progress our kids that are in our tier three interventions at least once a week sometimes more depending on what it is we're doing it but our kids once a week and if we see that a child so you develop so you develop an a mind this is where they are this is where you want to be over a amount of time and if we see the child that after three um progress monitoring so about three weeks of monitoring is not at near or above that aim line we need to change what we're doing we've got to stop we don't have time for ineffective intervention with kids we just don't have the time. It's not fair to them. And so we need to make this group smaller. We need to give them more intervention or change the intervention altogether. Those are your three options. And so that's what we look at. And sometimes it means, well, we're not sure why they're not doing it. And so we may need to go even deeper, like move to a, to a psychological assessment, bring in some experts and things like that. But that doesn't happen all that often. Mm -hmm. And so you need to have all these progress monitoring tools that target the skill that you're trying to improve. Yeah. Right. And so you need to have a library of that as well. Yeah. So let's talk about those resources that you are mentioning that are specifically targeted for the skills these students need. So we're not just going to teachers, pave teachers, typing oh, in God, the no. and no. getting whatever we need off of there. We're looking at quality intervention tools. Absolutely. What and you can go to, like what works where clearing house. There's, I mean, there's yeah. lots of sites that will rank interventions to uh, intervention screening and all those sorts of things that are effective. So, and there's so many of them. I, I, I mean, I'll, I, I did went through, I quickly went through our resource room and I was writing down the titles. So I, I remember what they all were for you here, but this is by, by no means a comprehensive list of what's out there, what's effective. So. These are kind of the, the ones that, um, with our experiences, where we, that we've sort of fallen into. Uh, sure. so, so one of them is called RAVEL. So that would be for um, our, really, our kids that are really super low. You know, we, we, we need to start them. So they, their letter, they don't have letter, uh, letter recognition, letter sounds. They haven't mapped those and, and those kinds of things. So that's down there. Um, and but perhaps their phonological, their phon, their phonic, their phonological parts doing well. And we also have like the PAT R, so it's the phonological awareness training um, for reading kit that we use as well. Um, all accessible literacy, we would that that's one that we probably use with autistic kids. It seems to be, be very effective there um, uh, with our, yeah. Uh, precision reading, I mean, precision reading has been around forever. It, it's a fantastic tool. And also, if you don't have uh, a, a one to uh, two that are good to look at that do a wider range is the uh, road to reading and road to the or road to code and road to the code and road to reading. Uh, those are fantastic uh, ones that we use as well. Um, and also, uh, I mentioned Kilpatrick. We, we also use like the Equipped for Reading Success by Kilpatrick. That's popular. Um, uh, uh, Acadience has a number of interventions, Seafall uh, uh, and, uh, and other ones like that, that do. Uh, you could look at 95% uh, group has stuff that, you, that uh, I would recommend. Um, yeah, there's lots of stuff out there. And really, it, it's around developing your library 
uh, and you've got somebody trained in level B assessment, you, you know, have them here and somebody who starts holding that knowledge and where the principal can come along and say, have you tried kind of these sorts of things and, and having that library to look at and saying, yeah, they're, certain, they're in this ballpark. This is what we're seeing. This is going to address that. Definitely. And, and those are important because while it is possible to create an intervention for a student that takes skill and time and we don't want to put that onus on our teachers because there is so much else they need to work on yeah. and, and and i think that sometimes teachers don't give enough credit to the work that goes into these these interventions um it, it as an just sort of side to this I was having a discussion with uh, the province of Alberta has settled on Fry's uh, high frequency word list. Um, and why did they settle on that? Well, there's no Canadian one, and all the more modern, they're, all the lists are like 95% the same. I, I mean, it, high frequency. And so in Alberta, they, they, they went on the Fry's list, and you know, they have as high frequency, you know, states instead of province and stuff like that and I, and and I was talking to teacher well why didn't they just change that well first you you would need to understand and and this is where I'm relating back to the assessments how high frequency word lists are arrived at it's not that somebody picked words out of you know out of the air and put them together in this list there's a lot of research and things that go along and that that the high frequency word tests have stayed rather static over the last 50 years and, and so on. And plus, and two, understanding that when you do an assessment, don't change it. You know, it's set up for this way. So even for us to put copyright things aside, they, let's put province in, in, in the place of states and that, it's still not, I mean, it's something like, I'm getting off track now because I was frustrated with this person, but they're, you know, saying, do that list. And if you want to add provinces, add provinces. But understand that the Fry's list is not just some, you know, thing that was picked out of there. That it that it was scientifically rigorously developed, and 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 have and pay honor to that. The same way that we would for these intervention programs, the scientific rigor that goes behind them, and and paying attention to that. If you want to go above and beyond past that, after doing that, by all means, but at least pay pay the uh, be honest to the tool. I guess it would be the best way to put that. Yeah, well, and then you also have the, those years of experience and the realistically, a lot of these programs could cost millions of dollars to create through the trial and error and copyright and everything like that. So you're just saving yourself all that time, research and work. And you know, that's something to be said. That's important. Your time is valuable. Uh, and there are other things that you can focus on aside from creating an intervention from scratch every time. Well, and it's like, it's, it's like consulting with an expert. You're bringing an expert into your classroom because the people that develop these are experts in those areas. They're, they'll know far more than, than most of us ever will. And uh, anyway, that's, that's a different soapbox. Of course. Okay, so now the child's gone through the intensive intervention. How do you judge that goal line for them to reach before yeah. they go from the tier three to tier two back to tier one? Yeah. So, so we know where they want to be. So I talked about an aim line. So we know where they're starting. We know what they want, where we need them to be. When we get them back out to, to, to that aim line, so it's at the bottom part of average. Mm -hmm. If we can get them from where they were, and that is a lot of work to get them to the bottom of average. It's, it's, it is so much work to get there because you're thinking about years of development. Like, okay, in grade one, it's not years. They might be two years behind because of their experience at home. But to do that, in addition to what their, uh, their colleagues are doing as well, and you think about just the, the scope of work it is, is the significant. So we get them to, to the bottom of average, but we're not done there because we still have them on our screening that we do. And we do screening three times. So if they start slipping or something, or the teacher comes to say, you know, this is happening, we will take another look at those kids mm -hmm. to see, okay, they may need some refresher in this or talking up in that or a whole different thing. So we maintain that awareness of the kids that have been in the program. And 
some of our programs, so a lot of our programs will run for 36 weeks um, with our kids. Um, our kids who, they just needed that little extra boost, you know, and all of a sudden they're nailing all the questions and our screening shows, boom, they've done it. Yeah, we kick them out. They're, we, they're not committed to 36 weeks. And then we have uh, other kids that are making the progress, but not the right and we're adjusting. They might be in the system for more than 36 weeks until uh, we get it. Um, especially our, our uh, severe uh, LD kids who, who just, there's nothing for it. It's about time. It's about just consistency and time and time and time. So they might be in it for years as we as we support them through it um but again that's when you need to, these kids are consistently going to be the below the aim line we know that but we but because we've done our uh, diagnostic we already know that so we're expecting that what we're looking for them it's not a 36 week program we're looking at a three-year program definitely and you know one thing to mention that I, I mean obviously i'm sure you're aware of it is the fact that some kids will plateau at a level and while, and that's where your screening picks up, right? Uh, when you've got them to this level and they're okay, but then when they go into that whole class instruction, they're not getting the support that they need to move further and progress. Uh, they're not, or perhaps, you know, we're, we could start dealing with things like uh, um, executive functioning or self-regulation issues there. So kind of our ADHD kids who one-on-one -on -one we're able to, you know, keep them somewhat focused on what we're doing for periods. And we have those tricks and in a larger group, they start getting lost and stuff like that. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and that's, an, that's an important too. I mean, our, our kids are complex and it's a, we're, it's a whole child we're looking at. We're not just looking at these uh, small aspects entirely although we're trying to improve that but there's other things that come into effect with kids too and depending on the kids i mean like family life there could be you know um we did have some kids who had a parent die of covid mm -hmm. right and that has a huge impact on on what the, we're doing in classrooms and stuff like, like there's so many things and as but you know what educators are used to that we're used to knowing about these sorts of things and these other tools that we bring just inform that overall understanding of the kids and sort of focuses and, and creates an efficiency in trying to uh, in, in in addressing the importance of literacy in their life and getting them to a point that we're happy with it definitely now, this is perfect on topic because we're right at the end of the year. How do you have that continuity between school years, especially when we're looking at the students that are on that at-risk tier two, tier three intervention? Yeah, sure. So we, we have our, uh, well, particularly with our tier three, our uh, learning support teachers maintain those files. And a lot of those kids, we're just going to pick up. Uh, you know, we know we're exited the year. We know we're in program with them. And we're just going to continue with that. Um, a lot of our kids uh, in our severe range or mild to moderate. So we either have an RPA or an IPP for our kids. And uh, we don't recreate those every September. It's a living document and it keeps going through. So we, it's not June, one teacher's done with it. And then September, another teacher starts a new one. It's, you know, it's a document they'll go through perhaps all six years or whatever uh, how, or however much support or where the kids at for that duration and so there's that we're maximizing the amount of instruction and intervention time we're having kids it's not about rediscovering kids every year we now have this information on the kids and we develop a database for um, on all of my kids in the school that have been with us from k whatever we have you know our grade sixes we have six years of data on them and understanding where they're at on each one of them and and the teachers have access to all of that information and we and also talking to the previous year's teacher you know what have you been doing even if they weren't if they were maybe they never got to tier three they're in tier two and having those transition those opportunities to have transition meetings between teachers and talk about kids and we also do that with uh, our kids that move out of our school to other schools is, is holding that conversation this is what we've done this is what we're doing this is what we would suggest we never tell another school what to do but to making sure that they understand understand sort of where were you we were going with the kid as well and it's it's just wrapping those services around and, and keeping them moving um yeah uh, sometimes i don't know in, in other schools we've done looping as well where the same teacher follows the kid so grade one will go one two three and then back to one and then the fours will go four five six and back to four 
uh, currently the school I'm at, that's uh, that's not happening. But that's one of the things that um, is is supported in research around effective. However, if you have a sort of a unfortunate teacher student pairing, that's that lasts for three years. And, yeah, I mean, there, there's strengths and weaknesses to each, each model because especially, you know, some students or some teachers are just that golden ticket for a certain grade level. And you want, you know, for kindergarten, this is the teacher you want because they're just so receptive and yeah. amazing at that level. And yes, you know, they're, they're great at other levels too, but they create that solid core foundation that's going to follow this kid for the next years and, you know, grade one, grade two. And it, it's all understanding, I guess, your, your work group and what works best for them. Yeah. So, and so it's up to, and, and different schools will have different opportunities. Small schools have different opportunities in which an entire staff has an, a, a very close relationship with one another because they need to, because of the necessity of the small school. Bigger schools have uh, economy of size. They have more resources available to them because they're able to cluster larger kids. And, and the only way that schools really save money to reduce to, is class sizes, right? The, if you cluster more kids, you got more. And so, for example, at our school, so our class sizes in, in uh grade one, they're in around 20, 20, mid twenties around there, which is much higher than I wanted. But it, what that afforded us this year is the number of um, uh, um, learning support teachers. So having three learning support teachers pulling kids out. And that's the only way we could, do it. we don't get magic money from somewhere else. So if you're in, and, and so next year, uh, because we, we hit the goals that we wanted to this year, we're reducing that back down to one learning support teacher and uh, well, a little more than one, but basically one for the school and continuing that work. But that's because we poured so much in on our kids in, in grades one, two, and three that we're affected by COVID that we're, we're our dad is telling us good job. Are we still back to hundred percent? We're not, but I do want to reduce class sizes again uh, because that has different advantages and stuff like that. And, and, and that's not new. I mean, principals have been, have been playing this game, uh, moving things back and forth, trying to get this. And, and, and I think that's a, that's a great conversation piece. Like uh, for, uh, for example, in your school, do you have a full-time Lots of them, lots of schools have a full-time phys ed teacher. Why do they have a full-time phys ed? So they can provide teachers preps because teachers need to have preps or they have a full-time music teacher and so on and so forth. And it's around aligning all the different things that need to do. And that falls on the principal and how they do it, whether it's through discussion or not talk or see or however it does. It's, it's part of the process that, that needs to be looked at seriously. And if, if you are, if you have literacy as your goal, if you have everybody on board or on literacy, then maybe the allocation of those resources start looking a little differently in your school as well. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for joining me this evening. I've really enjoyed our conversation and there's so much rich detail for people to go into uh, further looking at the various assessment batteries uh, that you suggested for that second level diagnostic um, level working with those students that you're screening at risk and you want to know more information about as well as different programs that you use within your school and suggested readings for the summer yeah oh yeah yeah I didn't even give you my whole suggested reading list that I, I would give people it's a long list and, and stuff like that but yeah and just being informed there's there's uh, and you will find that there's researchers you like to read and there's researchers that are difficult to read and, and stuff like that. But uh, it's, and the podcasts, um, what was the podcast? I would just, I know you were running time here. Uh, 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 um, Molly and. Mm -hmm. Melissa and Lori love literacy. No, that's not it. it was. Uh, oh, it's totally something my head. It's been a long day. If I, th if I think of it, I'll email you. It was a fantastic podcast series as well. Um, oh, we'll see you to get those up in the show notes. Indeed. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for having me on. You're welcome. <laughs>